Hi everyone, welcome to the Car Chat Podcast, and with me today I have Max Cooper. Hello. How you doing? Not bad, not bad. Can you tell the listeners a little bit about sort of who you are, what you do? Yeah, I'm uh, Maximilian Cooper, founder of Gumball 3000. Gumball is really kind of a car rally, famed for its car rally, but kind of more of a pop culture brand now that kind of has has its fingers in many different pies around the world with <laughs> merchandise and apparel and events, car, concerts, parties, and so on, really. All sorts of things. Because we first met, I think it must have been 2012, was my first rally, and I think that's when we were it, yeah. first met. But it, it started quite a bit before then. How did it, yeah, so how did it all start off? Yes, well, I started back in uh, the last century, in 1999, <laughs> which makes it sound... Uh, last millennium. You know, yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, scarily for me now, we have participants that enter the rally that weren't born when the first <laughs> rally happened. Wow. Which, which, to me, the rally feels like it started yesterday, as you can imagine. But, um, <laughs> but there you go. So, yeah, I mean, basically it came about because my... You know, my passion growing up was cars and, and sport and music. And, and the 1990s for me kind of put me into kind of, a, you know, brought me to London. I did a fashion design design degree at a place called St. Martin's. Mm-hmm. Lived that London social scene of parties and, you know, the fashion industry because I was studying design. I got a bit lucky in the early 90s that I got asked to model for some fashion brands that, that uh, paid me very nicely. And I spent all my money wisely on, on racing cars, basically. <laughs> nice. So I spent probably from about 1992, 93 to 97, 98 racing in various championships from your know, really basic Formula Fords mm. through to Porsche Super Cup. So, um, so, you know, I tried my hand. I tried to be the, you know, <laughs> a, dri- a racing driver. I wasn't that good, but, I, you know, I love it more than anything. And, um you know, so I think what happened for me was that, you know, I finished St. Martin's 93. I was racing, earning a bit of money through modeling then. So I didn't want to kind of join the real world, mm. whatever the real world is. At that point, I wanted to carry on doing what I was doing. With racing only being, you know, every other weekend or, or you know, a couple of days a week here, and you know, over the months. And the same with the fashion stuff that I was doing at the time was, again, very, very much kind of, you know, similar couple of days a week kind of thing. I did a, a law degree, which kind of that's fashion quite, to law was quite kind a, of... a curve. <laughs> you know, it was, it, was my, um, it was my challenge to myself at yeah. the time. I think I had a, you know, my, my dad's an artist and, and, and musician, so that's the world I knew and have grown up in. I don't think the family knows a doctor or a lawyer or anyone in the banking world. So I kind of thought, you know what, I'm going to see what the law, legal world, legal world is like, you know. And so anyway, I did a law degree, um, carried on modeling, carried on racing, finished that 97, and then sort of figured out what am I going to do. And, and essentially, if in the probably the 18 months before Gumball started, I had this really when I look back on it and I talk about it now, I just think how crazy was I at the time, but I tried to buy a Formula One team and I, I didn't have the money myself, but the team that I was driving for and part of back then was owned by a very wealthy guy, obviously wealthy enough to own a racing team and, and do Le Mans and everything. And essentially I, we became good friends and I essentially became his kind of, you know, a friend of his that would take him to these cool parties and this kind of different world that he wasn't used yeah. to. And then this, this sort of idea just kind of came between us to kind of recreate a little bit of a spirit and passion of days of motoring gone by, you know, from the Bentley boys to the James Hunt era, where everything seemed a little bit more fun and a bit more kind of, you know, great parties and the social scene to it. And I think it came about, you know, talking about this came about in a period of Formula One when Red Bull wasn't in in Formula One at that point. You know, it's the end of the 90s. It's that sort of period of of probably um, Damon Hill, probably being sort of champion. And I mean, Damon's a lovely guy and did, did Gumball back in 2001, but probably that era of the sport was lacking a few of the wild characters Mm. that, you know, 
decades, generations before had, had, had been, whether they were or not, we'll never know, but the story sounded great yeah. from, from Bentley Boys <laughs> onwards, you know. So anyway, I had this idea and to really kind of bring together the kind of what I'd learned, my knowledge from the sort of the fashion and the music world to create something that could, could incorporate that energy and style and culture to a racing team. And I always liken it back then that, you know, the 90s, uh, Williams were the most winning Formula One team. And they're brilliant, you know, and, and you know, won more, more races than anyone else in that period. But they were a race team. They weren't a brand. Yeah. They hadn't kind of become a brand. And, and it was at, the, at that time, and even now, you know, teams find it hard to become more than a race team. Yeah. You know, Ferrari is the obvious one that is a brand and, and is, you know, truly global and, and sells merchandise all year round and so on. But, but the others sort of struggle. And I sort of thought I could add to it a little bit. Anyway, bottom, long story short, we tried to buy Tyrrell, which was, uh, I got to become friends at that time with Ken Tyrrell, who founded an, an own Tyrrell Formula One team. And Harvey Postlethwaite, who, who was the sort of the team manager, who used to work for, for Hesketh and, and Hunt in the early 70s. I got to know him them as friends. We tried to buy it and it kind of went, quite far down the road of, of sort of doing the deal mm. and almost at the 11th hour of sort of signing a, an agreement to, to buy this team. Uh, it was announced that in um, Formula One, uh, tobacco advertising was going to be banned in something like five years from that time. Yeah. So all of a sudden the tobacco brands were sort of thinking, all right, we're going to spend again quickly. You know, we've got five years to, to kind of get our brands out there. And, and so anyway, British American Tobacco ended up buying Tyrrell, oh. became the VAR Formula One team. And they just put in a, at that time, I think we put in a bit of 15 million, yeah. which was, you know, me in my mid twenties sort of <laughs> negotiating to buy a Formula One team for 15 million. It was amazing, <laughs> you know, but anyway, Lucky Strike had, had a bit more money and, uh, and that deal didn't happen. But, uh, but what it did for me was during that sort of period of trying to put that together, I really got in touch with or, you know, connected with essentially my entire network of people that I thought would contribute to this in some way. Yeah. And whether that was fashion designers, models, rock stars, racing drivers, you know, the wealthy guys I'd met through, through racing cars, I essentially kind of got them all hyped on this idea and then it didn't happen. So what do I do? <laughs> yeah. So my next step was like, you know what? I've got such goodwill from everyone. I want to create something that they can all be part of. And that was how the idea of the rally came ah. about. It was my way to essentially bring all these sort of interesting and, and influential and, and, and characters that I'd become friends with over, you know, yeah. over my life, bring them all into one place, show them, give them a journey, have us have an adventure together. And then my thinking back then was if that went well, that might lead either to continuing the, the pursuit of having a race team mm. or creating a brand out of this that, you know, wouldn't necessarily be a car rally every year, but it would just be kind of the infrastructure of a, of a car rally, sorry, infrastructure of a, of a brand through this first car rally. Anyway, so we did the first rally, 1999, a little tour of Europe, London, Paris, Le Mans, Monaco, San Marino, back through Germany, uh, Hockenheim, and then back to London, across the finish yeah. line on Park Lane. And, and it was incredible. It was terrible and incredible. <laughs> yeah. it, was, it was not organized in the slightest. Yeah. But, you know, back then there, there, were, there, were no, there was no one watching it. There was no, no social media, no camera phones, no cameras really to note. It was really only an event for the 55 cars and 110 people that were yeah. that were in it. Um, but because they were sort of a, an amazing eclectic mix of these personalities, an amazing mix of cars and everything, it's it sort of, and I'd used my contacts that I've got in the fashion industry already at this point to kind of get, get it covered, featured, mm. uh, featured in a few magazines. And that rally was you know, April 99, and by September that year, when all the print magazine coverage came out on it, we got covers of Autosport to GQ <laughs> to FHM to, I mean, everything you nice. can think of, we were in. And it really kind of gave me that, wow, this is my route to yeah. creating 
what I want to create. So that was the, that's how it happened. Nice. Nice. Long-winded, but it is a story, you know. It's, oh, yeah. it's, well, it, you I know. didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. And then so presumably like year one to now, obviously there's been a lot of rallies in between, but like yeah. the... Did anything stand out from that first year that you were just like, okay, hadn't thought of that, ran into some major issues? We got oh, to work on I mean, this. You know, the thing was, I went into that first rally with, I think, just a, you know, I've been obsessed and, and, and still am with, I'm obsessed is probably the wrong word now, but kind of fascinated and, and intrigued by the pop culture world and how we look at different brands and, and especially studying fashion design, mm. you know, it always made me question back then, why does one person wear a white t-shirt that costs, you know, 10 quid from, <laughs> you know, H and M and another one buy one that's 500 quid from Gucci. It's the same t-shirt essentially, yeah. but we're all drawn and, and inspired and influenced by different brands, you know? So that was always my kind of thought process going into kind of creating this. And so that, that first, that first rally had just this idea of mine to get all these people together to create something that they could enjoy that would grow into this sort of culture of, of, mm. of a brand. But as an organizer, I knew nothing. <laughs> I'd never really put anything on before and, and, you know, nothing more than a house party. Yeah. Yeah. And suddenly I'm sort of, I've, I've kind of essentially looked at the map and put on a fantasy trip. Yeah. Anything that I could think of, that was incredible places, locations. And I utilized a lot of the contacts that I'd got at that time. And so, you know, I was friends with Terence Conran, who was a big design figurehead in, in the UK and owned the Bluebird Club, which was where the, the Bluebird race car was built and, and, and Sunbeam factory, which is on the King's Road in Chelsea mm, of all yeah. places. So I utilized that as the starting location. I mean, everything that, that could sort of, you could learn putting on an event that happened on that rally. I mean, right down to kind of the, the party that was the launch party that, that kicked everything off, the first ever Gumball party that happened maybe, you know, a couple of nights before the rally started was at this Bluebird Club. We closed it, we took it over. Uh, I mean, it had anyone and everyone attend that was in London at the time from, from Madonna and Guy Ritchie to, uh, you know, Kate, Kate Moss, all yeah. that kind of crowd. It was a cool, it was the cool party in London. Yeah, yeah. And um, I just remember, I don't know, you know, this is a very kind of plush club at the time. And I remember the next day just getting a phone call saying, I have to pay for a new carpet <laughs> in this place. And it was like, I still remember it now, but it was like, it was 11 grand. Oh, so, oh my God. I mean, <laughs> my first party and I've got to pay 11,000. And then as the days went on, I got more bills from them that it turned out that, in this incredibly beautiful club at the time, there's sort of shelves full of vintage red wines and whatever oh. that people were just helping themselves to. <laughs> so, so anyway, so Gumball kicked off with a proper rock and roll party, you know, yeah. and, and it really did. I mean, outside the front of the venue, there's a little forecourt outside this Bluebird uh, venue, which end, which was the, where the first start flag was waved. But, you know, the night of the party we had, three cars on display. We had Richard Atwood's Porsche 917. We had nice. a um, Ferrari um, uh, 512 LM, Ooh. which was incredible. And then I think we had, then we actually had the very first of the new Beatles, the new yeah. shaped Beetle that was branded all as Herbie. That was also yeah. on the rally. And that Ferrari was on the rally as well. And I remember it wouldn't start when the party was <laughs> finishing. And we got a fantastic photo of Kate Moss, like leaning oh, again, trying to push this car. <laughs> and when I think back to like the ingredients of what Gumball is now, it hasn't changed from that still yeah. opening night, you know, bit of damage cause, <laughs> you know, <laughs> great people together, a little bit wild, a bit rough around the edges and, and, um, but that's, that's what sort of, I guess, set Gumball slightly aside from anything that was going on in the kind of car world at the time. Mm. Why? But yeah, sorry, in reference back to your sort of other question of, of sort of, you know, what did I learn from it? I mean, the route around Europe, I mean, I, I really, I didn't budget very well for it. You know, I charged an entry fee of £3,000 per car. It was 3,000 miles around Europe. The, the Gumball 3000 bit, the name was really kind of, Marginally because of the mileage that I, this magical number I sort of figured out when I was 
that, that after 24 hours of Le Mans, which is my yeah. sort of favorite race and everything, you know, drivers have basically, cars have basically done 3,000 miles. So uh, it's, okay. so I always thought, you know, if you can do it in 24 hours, we'll space this out for six <laughs> days, it's going to be easy, you know. And then also, if you think, if you, um, anyone that's watching this that wasn't around in 1999 won't know that, won't know about this, but in 1999, everybody thought the world was going to end when the clocks changed from 1999 yeah, to 2000, yeah. you know, and all the computers are going to die and whatever. So everyone was really kind of obsessed about this, you know, step into the future into 2000. And I wanted to look further ahead. So I was the next millennium of <laughs> Gumball 3000. Yeah. We're going to get you know, a brand of the future was what it was about. Really. But um, so this, anyway, this 3000 mile drive around Europe was really, you know, I could barely afford to pay for the hotels. I had scheduled it so that the, the, the days were really tough for people, mm. which is actually what I wanted. But I guess I didn't realize how tough it would be on people <laughs> and also depend on what car you brought. I mean, to, to put it into, to give you an idea. And if you think people out there that see Gumball and think of it as parties and whatever, and it, you know, back then, particularly, it was an endurance as well in, in every shape and form. I mean, so day one was drive from London to, to Paris for a sort of a, a dinner stop and then onto this uh, chateau uh, near Le Mans, near the Le Mans circuit. Yeah. And people got to the Chateau, sort of Chateau d'Escamon, it was called it. People would get there at sort of 1 a.m., something like that. Yeah. You may, maybe, maybe from like, let's say 11 p.m. to 4 a.m. Yeah. Really, you know. So people were pretty already wiped out, you know, exhausted <laughs> when they got there. The next day, however, was just crazy. The next day was a short drive to Le Mans. We had breakfast there in the pit lane. We coincided the dates, or actually it just worked out that the dates were pre-qualifying for the actual Le Mans time oh, for nice, yeah. So all the race teams were there, everyone's there, there's even people in the grandstands. And we actually got to do an old-fashioned Le Mans start where we parked all the cars oh, on, yeah. the, on the start grid and we had to run across the road and jump in. And, and we got to do a lap and that was our little Le Mans experience. Okay. And then we drove to, to Monaco. We had, uh, you know, people got to Monaco late evening, let's say. Yeah. I'm not sure what time we left Le Mans, but, but late morning. So they got to Monaco late evening and they, you know, parked up in Casino Square and, you know, were directed to the Hotel de Paris for dinner and thought, oh, wow, this is amazing. And when they got there, they got this little route card information that said, after dinner, you have to drive across the, across Italy <laughs> to, to San Marino or to Rimini. And people were like, what? You know, I mean, they were already exhausted. And then they were told to just carry on. And so basically, I mean, that, you know, that the hotel in, in um, at the Chateau near Le Mans, the next night was in San Marino yeah. at a beautiful hotel there, you know, and, and um, nothing in between. <laughs> just a long drive. And, and um, this, it was over the weekend of the, form of the uh, San Marino Grand Prix. So people were scheduled to get into San Marino early morning on the Sunday, maybe catch a few hours sleep, you know, before the race, then watch the race and yeah. then party that night and then sleep that night. But of course, you know, people didn't get to San Marino, <laughs> some of them, until after the Formula One race. Oh, no. I mean, you know, and when they got there, they were just broken. People were in pieces. And, you know, of course, between that long drive as well, you've got cars breaking down, you know, people weren't prepared for this in any shape or form. I mean, I got the, the car mix of, you know, the entry grid that year was as good as it's ever been ever since, mm. you know, unbelievably. I mean, original low drag E-type to McLaren F1 LM Amazing. to Chris, to Chris Eubank driving his 18 wheeler cab, <laughs> the Peterbilt truck. I mean, he probably arrived into San Marino the evening after the oh, race, wow. <laughs> having just trundled through Europe, you know, but in a way became this character that when he arrived, he did the airborne on the truck and everyone would almost kind of know he'd <laughs> arrived and celebrate, you know. And so anyway, it, it was a real life wacky races that put people through their paces because it was I, the way I actually scheduled it to be, uh, uh, you know, this endurance but it also meant, you know, maybe people missed their breakfast, their dinners, their lunches. They'd, they got lost. They, I'd taken people out of their comfort zone. And 
and broken them. And during that event, you know, by San Marino, people hated me and, <laughs> you know, were threatening me and, and just didn't want to be part of it. And I don't know, for whatever reason, nobody dropped out. And, and then by the time they crossed the finish line back at the Met Bar in, on Park Lane in London, they were elated more than you can imagine. Yeah. And it had that impact on them that then they sort of everyone had bonded and we're sort of friends for life. And it's a bit like that every year. Hard to recreate this once in a lifetime experience every year, but it genuinely does. It does bond people. Yeah. And, and I'd say that anyone that did that first rally now, if there, any of them were to bump into each other at any point, they would be literally hugging each other and just sort of, you know, felt yeah. they achieved something. And that, I guess, was a bit of the magic that Gumbel brought to the table that made us very different from anything that I'd ever done before in the car world. I'd, I'd driven in lots of Ferrari owners club events and, and Porsche owners club, owners club and enthusiast clubs and mm -hmm. things. And, you know, nothing was quite like Gumball. And that's been our little bit of our, yeah. you know, unique factor. So, no, yes. <laughs> definitely the, the 3000 miles, whenever anyone asks me about it, I'm like, yeah, but the thing is, it's 3,000 miles, and that just takes <laughs> a really long time. Yeah. And like, you yeah. can't mess around. You have to just be going and driving yeah. and driving yeah. and driving. Yeah. <laughs> and we squeeze in a few things in between as well. You know? Exactly. So it's an overload of the senses that week, and it does break people. You know, I, I'd say if you hadn't had a bit of a meltdown on Gumball, it'd be unusual. Yeah, it's. I don't know if you have. But, I've definitely you know, had a meltdown. Like, yeah. pretty much, or got to that point. The problem I've always found is talking to people, and this just this sounds ridiculous, but like at the time when you're talking to people that are not there on it, yeah, and you maybe are not being very good at replying to people or that sort of stuff, and you're yeah, like, yeah. no, honestly, I'm all I can think about is after the four hours of sleep I've had or less each night. It's like yeah. getting myself to the next place. Yeah. For me, like taking photos, editing, whatever, doing all yeah, that yeah. stuff, yeah. and then just carrying on. And then when it ends, invariably people, have, everyone seems to start doing a road trip back home afterwards. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> True. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's just, it takes so much out of you. But like you said, it it pushes people together and everyone bonds. And even if you look at some of it and go, that was awful, you get to the end and you're like, I feel like I've done a month's worth of activities in a yeah. week. That was amazing. Yeah. 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 And just shared a, a unique adventure, mm. you know, and, and over the years, obviously I've tried to take the rally to, you know, furthest corners of the world where events haven't happened, you know, and, and, and we're a totally new, new spectacle in that country or city or, and, and we're, we're embraced, you know, it's people really enjoy it. So and it's grown as you as you've sort of seen and experienced that you know from those early years where there were no friends and family waving the car off through to driving into Rupert Street in yeah. 2014-15 you know over half a million people there throughout the day is is incredible you know that must be an amazing thing to have seen evolve from the beginning just this idea some parties whatever when did it start getting to the point where there was people lining roads and standing on bridges and being there for arrivals and stuff like that so so basically we like i said the first year was was the unknown and and, and no one there just just a handful of people to wave us off and you know people parking the cars at the hotels and and all of that really basic sort of stuff and and then 2001 we did a rally from london to russia to st petersburg and back through scandinavia to london and I invited these crazy friends of mine from LA on the rally called the Jackass Guys, uh, Johnny Knoxville and, and co, who had a huge show on MTV at the time. And, and I got to know them four or five years prior to that through, through, through skateboarding, which is something I used to sort of, there's a teenager and still love the culture of it. And, yeah. and anyway, become friends with them and they're doing really well. And, and we'd actually reconnected before that rally because their first series of MTV, um, MTV wouldn't insure them in the US to, to do their show. <laughs> so they had to go and do lots of their stupid sort of stunts and, and sketches over here in, yeah. in London. And so we'd hang out and, you know, became really close friends. And, and um, 
So then I'm doing Gumball and obviously they're aware of that. And so 2001 comes around and they're the biggest show in America at the time on MTV. Yeah. And I like, come on, you know, <laughs> come and do it. So they came on it. We made an hour long TV special, MTV special. It was you know, the highest watch show on MTV in 2001 nice. in America, which was huge for us. And that was the tipping point in terms of awareness. And, and um, we then, after that one, we did the rally again in North America in 2003 and put out a really, put out a film that we made called Gumball 2000, the movie, um, which Universal put out and, you know, it was a really successful kind of piece of media. Then we did Paris to Marrakesh to, to Cannes. And then 2005, we brought the rally back to London, back to starting London again. And that was the point where the fans came in their masses. So we, we were, that year, we were starting the rally in Pall Mall and we closed sort of low Regent Street and this sort of little area to display the cars before the rally. And then we were going to sort of parade off down, down Pall Mall and St. James. And we'd got enough stewards and staff and volunteers and, and police and everything to, to cater for something like, I'm guessing that, but around 5,000 people is, is what we were expecting, mm. which was a, a huge number compared yeah. to sort of the previous time in London where we probably had 200 people yeah. sort of watch. Anyway, the police estimate that 150,000 people came. <laughs> so, you know, it was chaos. It was absolute chaos. Imagine. It was the whole of, so the cars were all parked in this sort of low Regent Street area. And then we set off driving down, I said down, People know London driving down uh, St. James and up, up uh, to Piccadilly. And we didn't have barriers or anything in the roads at the time. It was just a sea of people <laughs> looking down these vast, long, wide London streets. All you could see was people all in the middle of the road completely. And we had to kind of wade through at sort of, you know, one yeah. mile an hour to get out <laughs> of London. And this kind of crowd of people stretched sort of, I don't know, probably three quarters of a mile or something. Wow, yeah. And that was the sort of, that was the year that, you know, London, because obviously we worked with the cities to, to put these events on, you know, London sort of said, you know, you can't do that again, you know, <laughs> or when you do that, when you want to do the rally again, your production plan has to be 20 times bigger, yeah. you know, whatever than it was. And essentially that's how Gumble kept on growing, you know, year on year. And, um, but yeah, I, I put it down to the Jackass show and, and the Gumball 3000, the movie as being the kind of the, the, the eyes of the world at the time, because really this was still pre-social media days. Mm. So it was the only way people could see it really. Yeah, that's mad. What's, okay, what goes into something like shutting down Regent Street when you know there's going to be like a couple of hundred thousand people there? Well, for one, I mean, Regent Street, you know, again, those people that know London, it's it's like one of our prime you know, city centre spots. There's not many events go on there for a start. You know, it's kind of you've got to kind of submit your uh, application. You've got to get to know everyone in the council. <laughs> and I, essentially, you know, my role over the years has increasingly become an, a sort of a, an ambassador for this putting on gumball, but putting on a kind of festival of cars and culture and music right, and everything yeah. and, and essentially dealing with cities on that level and and london's no different you know so, but in some countries i'm dealing with the minister of culture or sport mm. in london it's mostly dealing with the city uh, you know westminster Ca council and government and yeah i mean our production plan is just vast i mean last time we were in london we had i don't know three thousand staff working the event <laughs> so you know part of me i used to have and i actually my wife jokes at me on this one that and the lead up to the rally every year the sort of maybe the, the last sort of four or five weeks leading up to it i have nightmares where i, I wake up that i put the big event on and nobody's come yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? but at least for that one for london i was like you know what if nobody comes i've already got three thousand people that, that are working the event. Yeah. so it's going to look okay you know? yeah. just huddle in a so, yeah yeah but, you know, you can imagine with, with all of these sort of putting on live events in, in, you know, across any forms of entertainment, 
things can go wrong and you're dictated to by the weather and, and you know, things that might happen in, in the world at that week or whatever, you know. Yeah. So there's so many moving parts that I sometimes think just to kind of get through that rally and, and to put it on is a success for us, you know, now. <laughs> Yeah. Because there really are. I mean, it, it's sad. I mean, it, we're, we live in these crazy times, it seems like, the last sort of 10 years in particular, where there's so many, you know, negative things in the world. Mm. And, and, and we, you know, we've even had to reroute the rally, change the route, not mid-rally, thankfully, but, you know, kind of two or three months before the rally where one of the cities on routes had some terrorist attack. And, and of course, no one then wants yeah. to bring a live event there and you know we're just dealing with a lot of factors to put on a live event anyway and if you times that by a week-long event that goes through multiple countries and sometimes multiple continents in one week it's just so many kind of moving pieces that if i were to stop and break it down and think why do i do this yeah, yeah. <laughs> i probably couldn't do it i just have to get on with it and presumably because you've done one a year you have a year or do you now, are you now planning like three years ahead? Yeah, we, can, we plan sort of, sort of circa two to three years ahead. And that's that's not only because of the planning aspect, but that's also because sponsors tend to sign a sort of a, let's say a three-year deal. Yeah. And they want to know what you're doing for three years if they, they're going to sign on the dotted line. <laughs> so we sort of have to uh, be looking that far ahead anyway, really. Has it been, because Gumball over the years has had this sort of, party crazy mad image does that yeah. make it quite difficult to work with sponsors at times uh, depending on the sponsors i guess I, i'd actually say no I, I'd, I'd say that um you know we've got if you look at the ingredients of what we are you know we're an amazing collective of people including lots of celebrities of different genres you know from sports world and music mm. world to now e-gaming world to to uh, car enthusiasts, to, you know, we cover a, lot, a, a very wide audience and we cover a very wide audience that collectively is kind of a, you know, let's say a, used to be an 18 to 30, but now it's the sort of almost a, a 14 to 30 year old demographic, mm. heavily male orientated. I mean, I wish it was more equal, but that's the reality of it. Yeah. It's sort of heavily male. And there's just so many brands out there that are trying to reach a 14 to 30 demographic you know, get their brand out there. And here we are, we kind of tick a lot of boxes and we're obviously a lot less than someone sponsoring a Premier League football team or a, yeah. you know, Formula One car. And, you know, and, and we're also something that sort of offers a couple of quite unique areas for a sponsor that, you know, they, they, they have this unique reach to the drivers in the rally, which is call it a, you know, you know, a very influential collective of people. Mm. So in a sense, that can appeal to a lot of uh, luxury brands and, and and sort of, you know, anyone that kind of, but even the mainstream brands, if they just want that sort of brand association with, with let's say, one of the DJs that's on the rally. Yeah. Um, but then we also have this sort of very large outreach, as we discussed, you know, where we're putting on events for hundreds of thousands of public to attend. Mm. And so there's a lot of good different touch points and brands can activate in various ways and of course, from the rally standpoint, what an amazing piece of content, yeah. you know, and people are always looking for content, you know, so it's actually been okay. It's been good. And, and I'd say, you know, every year we kind of draw up our wish list of sponsors that we'd love to reach. And, and over those last two decades, we've had pretty much all of them. You know, we, we always have like a, you know, sports brand as a partner. We've had yeah. Nike, Adidas, Puma. We've got Kappa now. We traditionally had an energy drink. We had Red Bull, Monster, Rockstar. We've had them yeah. all sort of thing in those genres. And, and now very much moving forward, a lot of the e-gaming and video games partners. So, I, you know, I think we, we, we tick a lot of boxes to, to give people reasons to work with us. Yeah. And presumably doing things like shutting down Regent Street or putting on these massive events is very expensive. And yeah. whilst the entrance fee is a lot, you've only got a hundred cars or whatever it is. So how does yeah. that work out in the like, percentage of the entrance fee versus sponsorship to put to even just like put on the on the rally? I mean, the rally is tends to generate sort of. Of course, it's not, budget's never as simple as this because you've got overheads for a year and you've got staff to pay and everything. Yeah. But let's say the rally itself, the seven day budget of this one event we 
have all the entrance fees, 120 cars, they'll pay sort of 50 grand yeah. to enter. Plus we generate a similar amount in sponsorship revenue. Okay. And that tends to kind of, I mean, that covers the cost of the event. Now, if we're, uh, so we're, we're talking ballpark figures, but let's say we're around the 10 million mark yeah. to put the event on. Now, if we therefore are down by a couple of big sponsors, we're, we're, we're under budget, yeah. you know, because quite often we've already, you know, we're contracted to put on that main stage in yeah. whatever city it is and, and do all of that. So, you know, it, it's a lot of pressure on everything. Mm. And I've really always kept the rally to being, you know, the, the entry fees that come into the rally go into the rally completely. Uh, and I always, it's everything else that we do as a company where we generate the rest of the money for the, you know, that the company can, can uh, hopefully profit from. Yeah. Um, and I mean, now, I mean, I, I, I'm, you know, you've, you've seen that we do multiple bits of merchandise and whatever, and, but through license deals and our own merchandise, we currently sell product, Gumball products and products in about 40,000 stores around the world. Nice. So, you know, the numbers have got bigger over the years and, you know, over the last two decades, some big things like that, we've had, we had a PlayStation video game. We've got another one in the works right now, nice. which comes out in two and a half years time which is multi-platform, yeah. Xbox, PlayStation, everything, which is amazing, yeah, exciting yeah. for us. Um, we've got a range of Hot Wheels toy cars oh, awesome. through to sunglasses with Carrera, Kappa clothing range. You know, these are great partners to have because these brands are investing in Gumball. Yeah. They're also performing the facility that we don't have in terms of distribution. Mm. You know, I mean, the, the Hot Wheels toy cars, I've got one on my desk right now, so I've got to show you. Oh, nice. Here's the latest one that's not even out yet. Oh, can, right. uh, yeah, 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 the Huayra. It, it's the Huayra that I drove on Gumball in 2015. Yep. It come, comes out next month. But, you know, Hot Wheels make between 500,000 and 2 million of each car that we release. Wow. So, you know, we sell a lot of cars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's such a, a funny like turn from starting, you know, starting a, a rally. And then I remember, I don't know when it was, when you, you really started to push the merch and that side of it. I think yeah. that was probably just about when I started yeah. coming along, actually. The, yeah, yeah. New York to LA and there was a lot more merch. Yeah. And then I, I always knew this is one of the things that you, you're you really passionate about is is that yeah. side of it. To then having yeah. little Hot Wheels cars. I mean, that's so cool, oh, isn't amazing. it? As a, as a yeah, car yeah, enthusiast. Yeah. I mean, my very first ever licensed deal with Gumball back in 2000 after the first rally was with uh, Hasbro toys for top trumps playing cards. Yeah, I've got a set of that and, uh, You know, I grew up in the seventies having a hot, having top trumps, you know, supercars. Yeah. To then, you know, a <laughs> couple of decades later to have your own version of them was like, oh my God. And now to have Hot Wheels toy cars. That's so cool. Nothing better, you know. And you can just have them on the shelf, don't take up very much space. Yeah, no, yeah. that's great. <laughs> exactly. At what point in time did you decide, you know what, let's fly some cars in a plane? Good question. <laughs> and and, and um, the question should be, why did I do that, <laughs> I think? Um, it, it, it was the second rally. It was the actual oh, wow. second one. So I, I've given you the story of that first one, Yeah. the first year's rally. And I came out of that first year's rally owing a lot of money. You know, I, I, when I say owing money, I, I probably owed each hotel a little bit more payments. I owed for the carpet bill for the launch yeah. proxy venue, <laughs> various things. It, it probably amounted to sort of a couple of hundred thousand that I owed, yeah. which, you know, in my, you know, whatever I was back then, so 27 or something, it was a huge it's quite daunting. sort of pressure to kind of have, you know. Yeah. And, but the good thing was that everyone had enjoyed that round wanted me to organize another one. And then you've also touched on it about sponsorship. After the, well, this media came out in the first rally, my little office at the time was kind of from my, you know, one bedroom news house in London. And we were getting inundated by letters through the post from fans that wanted a piece of Gumball merchandise, like a hat or a sticker yeah. or something. We were getting brands calling up wanting to sponsor us. So it was like an incredible sort of time. And, and so I actually signed for the second rally. I signed a really big sponsorship deal with Red Bull and with Diesel, the, the yeah. fashion brand, the Italian fashion brand. 
And so that really was the, you know, what threw me into organizing the second one. And because it had this sort of wacky races element, where did the second one go? You know, what's the route going to be? I don't know. I, I never thought I was going to organize a second rally. It was just, that wasn't the plan. Yeah. So at that time I was still in London and, you know, so London was going to be the start and, and also the finish. I had just had it in my head that we do another loop around Europe, but a different one. Mm. And, and then, do you know what? I genuinely cannot remember where I had this idea to fly the cars. But anyway, what happened was for the second rally, I, I hired these Russian cargo planes that fit 55 cars on each plane. And then I hired a passenger plane. And I didn't tell anyone about this that was entered <laughs> because I, found, I also found it very amusing, slightly amusing, that um, I sent out these personal sort of handwritten invitations for people to, to enter the event. Yeah. And, um, and I'd increase the entry fee the second year to I think five or 6,000 yeah. pounds. So again, not, not massive, but still enough to give me a bigger yeah. budget. And, um, and people would pay and enter without me telling them what we were doing. Really nice. But yeah. I was, I mean, it was kind of amazing. Like, yeah. all right. So people just really just want to be part of this, yeah. you know? And, and that was the element of it that made me realize that, you know, we just were, we become very quickly this kind of bucket list or thing to do mm. for people that had heard about it at the time that was successful. So that, I guess the, that melting pot of 110 people on the first one just did a really good job of telling everyone they knew yeah. about it, you know? And, and anyway, so I wanted to kind of make the second one, this real, you know, unknown sort of incredible adventure. And so when people set off from that second year from um, Marble Arch and they, this thing, this, which we almost kept to this day, really, they got a route card that was telling them where they were driving yeah. to. And they all just assumed that they were just driving to, to France, you know, to the Euro tunnel. Yeah, yeah. Or, uh, actually, the Euro tunnel, Euro tunnel wasn't there. <laughs> so <laughs> probably not the Euro tunnel at a the boat. time. But, but to a boat, to a ferry. And they weren't. Their, their little route card told them, you're driving to Stansted Airport. <laughs> And everyone's like, literally like, you know, what, what is going on? You know, so they drove to Stansted and they're waiting for them on the runway, two giant handcraft planes, Sick. this passenger plane. And I end up flying everyone to Southern Spain. And they get off the plane that early evening that, that day, same day. And then they get a route card and they have to drive up to Bilbao. And I'd hired the Guggenheim Museum for that night for a huge party. You know, and, and so that, and the next day was to Cannes during the film festival. Yeah. And I added in these kind of incredible elements to this week that you just couldn't get anywhere else at the time. And, and um, but why I did the planes and how I came to do the planes, <laughs> I've got no idea. But, but what it did do is it, again, it, it, it created something really unique. Mm. It was a wow factor beyond yeah. to a certain extent. And then I obviously realized that, you know, we could, can make the world a very small place. So subsequent <laughs> years, in like 2006 was the next year we used these aeroplanes and, and actually that year did a three continent route, flew the cars twice mid rally. So, you know, it made the world a small place. That one, I, when people talk about certain rallies, I hear that the, the, the one that went to Thailand, everyone's like, that was mental. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they've all got their kind of their, they, their pros and cons, yeah. but that one was, that one was essentially a thousand miles to Europe, a thousand miles to Asia, a thousand miles to the US, all in six days, essentially. And probably seven or eight days with the losing a day and gaining a yeah. day or whatever. But um, we drove from London to Belgrade, from Belgrade, flew everyone to Phuket, Phuket up to Bangkok, and Bangkok to Salt Lake City, to Vegas, to Los Angeles, finished on Rodeo Drive, and finished party at the Playboy Mansion. I mean, Pretty what cool. a week. <laughs> And, and yeah. yeah, with all this flying, that still doesn't tick off the road miles. You've still got to do the 3,000 miles, yeah. excluding yeah. the flying, yeah. which condenses your time a little bit sometimes. But I also thought, you know, what, what an incredible week. If, you know, one day you're driving through sort of rainforest in Thailand and then 24 hours later you're driving through the desert in Nevada. Yeah. It, it's just incredible. So, so cool. And, and like, yeah, a completely different element to starting in London, driving to Monaco and going to Italy or whatever. Like yeah. Getting on a plane yeah. and flying for 10 hours or whatever, you really yeah. do just get dropped from 
yeah. one end of the planet to the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just, you know, people on the rally are generally quite well experienced. You know, they can afford to do the rally, they can afford to have a nice car and, and such. But so in, in a way, I sort of almost had to up my own game every time <laughs> to give, you know, some affluent, well-experienced, well-traveled people an experience they haven't had before. Yes. You know? Yeah, that must be tricky to keep. Do you feel like a pressure to one-up yourself every time, every time, every time? There's definitely a pressure on 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 every on every element of it. You know, if we try and put on music concerts or add to the event or or um, you know, like I said, the route pressure to just do something. I think it's a it's a it's a pressure that I enjoy. Mm. Because it's almost the the challenge and the motivation that that kind of keeps me excited about it. Yeah. If we had ever done, like you said, if the rally just became London to Monaco every year, yeah. Whilst it might be a great drive and I might enjoy it, I, I wouldn't have the same energy and enthusiasm to to keep recreating that. Yeah. So to be able to sort of look at the map and think, where haven't we been? Where would be nice to take this? That's really kind of quite quite cool still and exciting. Are there still lots of places you want to go? It's getting less harder. and less. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I used to think probably if I if I'd um, lived a couple of centuries before, I probably would have been an explorer because I yeah. always loved just going to new places and just being thrown in at the deep end. You know, even you know, a decade before starting Gumball, I was that guy that would just. I went to LA on my own, uh, to to the US actually yeah, landed in LA on my own and. And I sort of hitched and took trains and whatever across the US with no plan, <laughs> just to sort of, I had a, a, you know, sort of maybe a two month window of, yeah. you know, no plans. What do I do? I'm going to explore. I'm just going to go somewhere. And, and I, I think Gumball's enabled me to still do that, yeah, to do that to a certain way. I mean, we've taken the rally to North Korea, we've, we've done Japan, we've done, like I said, Southeast Asia, every European country pretty much, or bar maybe sort of Iceland and <laughs> I think everywhere else we've covered and yeah yeah you've done a lot like so let me try to think which was which was the 20th anniversary was that 2019 yeah that, that was London to Tokyo London to Tokyo so that was another yeah. another plane job Japan uh, yeah. the pictures from Japan looked so cool it's just a cool place yeah. yeah do you have do you have some standout stops from the the full time do you have like any particularly you know, like that was really quite special for, for some reason. I, I mean, right? there are ones that were stand out for different reasons. I mean, that on that 2006 rally that we just mentioned, when we arrived in Belgrade, it was just beyond ridiculous, the amount of people that turned up to see us. Uh, it was actually a public holiday in Serbia that day mm. anyway. And we got permission on the drive down from Budapest to Belgrade where the planes were taken off from. We, we got a, they closed the highway for us. And, and so that was a really nice sort of, they wanted to make it a public day. Yeah. That was the whole thing. But, and then we had a, we were driving to Belgrade city center and the mayor of Belgrade was hosting lunch for everyone in the city hall. Mm. And then we drive from there to the airport and getting to that city hall was like I told you about London and the sea of people and there's probably 150,000 yeah. people. Belgrade was at that times 10. Wow. And I mean, I even, I didn't make it to the city hall. And I mean, I had my staff, you know, my crew with the mayor at the time calling me saying, you know, when you're going to be here, he's waiting for you. We've got media waiting. I just couldn't get there. It was just too many fans <laughs> in the streets that it was scary. Yeah. Because it was, and also if you're in a low sports car, I was in a, I was in a Ferrari, um, uh, what was that, 612 Skagliati at the time. And, and um, you know, you're fairly low down and all you see is waist up <laughs> people around the car. You can't actually see even yeah. 20 feet in front of you. And uh, and I think I realized from, you know, asking people around the car, you know, how far I was, even though I'd driven this route a couple of times and been to the city hall and met the mayor and everything previously, I think I figured out at this point when I was supposed to be there, I was probably like another hour away because of this yeah. sea of people. And I just had to reroute and go straight to the airport. But, you know, other gumballers that day, everyone felt the same. I mean, it, it almost felt like, I think we, I think at the time people 
coined the phrase of like the day the cars came to Serbia. <laughs> <laughs> the day Gumball yeah, came yeah. to Serbia, things will never be the same again. <laughs> you know? um, and it was also televised on on, a, on MTV, again, with some of the other Jackass guys, Bam and, and these guys, yeah. that Bam was in this purple Lamborghini. And I think, he, you know, people thought he was a rock star and, <laughs> and he was a rock star yeah. of, his, of his era, you know, and, but just phenomenal scenes. So... Yeah, I rem- one that stands out for me, I'm, I'm trying to think where it was. It was somewhere like Riga on, yeah. at some point in time. And I think it was possibly the first Tony Hawk demo that I'd seen. Oh, yeah, the, the, that was Warsaw. Wars- Warsaw, yeah. Yeah, and that was crazy as well, wasn't it? That was just arriving and then you're like, oh, yeah, by the way, we've got some skateboarding going on. And like this massive vert ramp is in the middle of a square yeah. with like, I don't know, 50,000 yeah. people or something around it. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then just be, you'd be like, yeah, Sam, you can go and stand on the top. It's like, what? Yeah, just go, just yeah. go on the top. So you go and stand on the top of this vert ramp. Yeah. With Tony Hawk busting some tricks and like 50,000 people around. I was like, okay. Yeah. This yeah, is yeah. different. That was, that was, a, that was a really good one. So, yeah. Yeah. It was pretty cool. But there have been many. Been, I mean, you imagine 21 years of, of yeah. these journeys and, and, um, you know, so many great checkpoints and cities. And I, I mean, I understand that once. I mean, like I said, it became a bit of a, a sort of a, a fantasy trip in the sense of whatever we could think of to try and achieve, we, we put it in there. I mean, having hosting awards at the end of Gumball with Hugh Hefner was <laughs> like, when I look back on it, it was like, did I really do that? You know, but yeah. <laughs> we had lunch in Elvis Presley's house on the Rally Bonny. <laughs> That's so amazing. Uh, just, just really kind of fun, fun things. Yeah, and lots of Formula One races en route, and you know, big events. Yeah, things like the Indy. I remember Indy Five Hundred and yeah. stuff like that. Just yeah. trying to link in all of these things. That was people yeah. ask me sometimes. They're like, "What's Gumball like, and how does it compare to other rallies?" Yeah, and it's those things that separate yeah. to me, like. Anyone can plan a route from one place to another and organize it. Yeah. And you can go and drive it. Yeah. But as far as I'm aware, and I don't know whether any of the other rides have got remotely to that size, when you turn up somewhere on Gumball, every entrant is like a rock star. So yeah. You, and there's like yeah. T- yeah. tons and tons of people yeah. just like, yeah. and yeah. you're driving yeah. through the city and it's like absolutely crazy day before no one there day after no one yeah. there but you just yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, I, like i said i think that's a bit of the the magic ingredient somehow that we we got very early on and you know i'm uh, even before starting novel as i said before i've driven lots of car rallies and and and, and you know one day runs and whatever and even since doing gumball i get invited to to many of the other rallies and and enjoy them but they there's nothing quite quite gets the public out for some reason like Gumball does. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but because you know, there's, there's, I've been on car rallies like yourself, where there's been every you know Ferrari cavalcade. There's yeah. every amazing Ferrari in existence, yeah. but this still doesn't create the same no. frenzy. And I, I almost don't know why that is. <laughs> no. Is it the DJs we have on the rally? Is it the, I don't know. I think it's just a combination of all of it. And, and I also think that, like I said before, that um, we are such an eclectic mix that you can be anything from, you know, David Hasselhoff in the Knight Rider car to LaFerraris to Bugattis to vintage American muscle cars to Tesla, anything. Yeah tricked out Japanese race cars. I, I mean, anything and everything automotive, I, even when we kind of orchestrate, you know, the, the entry grid, it's, it's kind of trying, trying to kind of cherry pick the ultimate entry, entry mm. grid of a list of cars and people. And you don't want every, you know, every hour wanted to be at least 30 different nationalities of driver, yeah. which again, gives it kind of a really big global appeal. You don't want it to just be a grid full of Ferraris, yeah. even though it look amazing. You, you want it to be diverse, which is what this is. So, so do you vet the entrance and the cars? Yeah, as much as possible. So, as we've sort of grown over the years, it's probably been about ten years, the last ten years now that the entry grid is made up of fifty percent of the cars or fifty percent of the people are from the alumni, from mm. people who've done it before, and fifty percent are new. And I mean, generally, if it's people have done it before, I'm not going to sort of tell them they can't do it in a certain car and yeah. you must do it in another one because most of them become friends of mine. And 
I've seen them do it before. I know they're going to bring something special yeah. to the table. Um, but with the new entries, of course, if we got, I don't know, 10 people all entering the same car, then I wouldn't want any more of that car. Yeah. You know, there'd be that sort of vetting process in a sense. But, um, but equally, I want it to be, like I said, not just nationalities, all different walks of life, all industries, all characters together. Yeah, that's one of the things I've I've talked about with people a lot is it's the people. The yeah. people you get it really on is. the rally make the rally. They Yeah. You can forget all the rest yeah. of the stuff. It's hanging yeah. out with all of these people. Well, one of the nice things about Humble is that it appeals to people that would never do a car rally if it wasn't for this. Yeah. Of course you've got a portion of the rally that are I mean, everyone's obviously into cars to a certain extent to what you do it. But let's say you've got a portion of the people on the rally that, that will go to any rally, every rally, because they just love cars, they've got the time, and, you know, they're passionate about doing that. Yeah. You've got others that, even referencing a skateboarder, let's say, yeah. well, they're not just any skateboarder. They're skateboarders that made it probably to the pinnacle of their profession, yeah. want to do gumball. Because maybe Tony Hawk does it or, you know, I don't know, yeah. other, other people they look up to. And maybe they've, not everyone's even as wealthy as a foot, everyone being able to afford every nice car or whatever, but a lot of the athletes or the DJs, they, certainly the athletes have a lot of sponsors. Mm. So their sponsors pay for them to do the rally. And, and um, so again, it's just this, it creates this melting pot of, of people that, that I've seen... I've seen like a head of a global bank become friends with a graffiti artist from New York and a, yeah. you know, a tattoo artist from Japan become friends with a conservative insurance guy <laughs> from the UK. And these are just people that you wouldn't put together normally. And, but, you know, we, we're all, that's what's nice about it, that if you put people in a share of this adventure together, then we're all just people. We all enjoy it. And it doesn't, what's nice is that no one cares about who anyone is on the rally. When they enter, yeah. it, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a billionaire or, a, you know, whatever, because you're just all thrown into this journey that you don't almost have time to figure out what they do or whatever. Yeah. And it's almost you kind of find out what people do for a profession, probably weeks or yeah. days or weeks after the round. Yeah, yeah. And you think, oh, my God, that's that guy, you know. And I mean, we had the founders of, of Facebook and PayPal do the rally for several years. And we actually had them even do it before they launched Facebook and yeah. Paid. <laughs> and then have them on it, on it again 10 years later when these are, you know, companies yeah. that are kind of global, some of the biggest companies in the world. And, you know, they're just normal people. Yeah, definitely. That thing of like, you drive past someone and they stopped on the side of the road, you're like, oh, that's Steve in the Ferrari, whatever. Yeah. yeah. And then you're like, oh yeah, he's like in charge of some blah, 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 blah or super famous yeah. or whatever. But actually yeah. he's just Steve and oh, you're like, hey Sam, how are you doing? Like, exactly. It's definitely that. Exactly. Like once you've got your driver band on or whatever, yeah. the barriers, it's, it's, it's not like you've been pre-vetted, but I think for some people, yeah. they don't necessarily want to talk to random people. They might get people come up to them all the yeah. time, but yeah. if you're on the same rally, they just let their guard down a bit and we'll actually just, yeah. everyone just talks to each other and hangs out. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. No, it's definitely, definitely a good one. If you had troubles at borders? <laughs> Is that a joke? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, many troubles at borders. Um, what do you mean by that? Okay, like, like, can't get into border yeah, countries? Yeah, yeah. Just like any particular nightmares of us getting from one country to another that should be fine, but isn't. Yes. So there's, there's only really one that ever kind of springs to mind. I mean, there's been, in the early years of Gumball getting into Eastern Europe, it was, it was kind of a long winded process because it was very much that kind of almost, uh, you know, Soviet, Eastern Europe still of passport and papers and all that, that mm. kind of thing just took a long time. But back in 2010, we were doing a route, which again, used airplanes, the route is from London to New York. And we were driving from London to Amsterdam, staying overnight in Amsterdam. And the next day driving from Amsterdam to Copenhagen, Copenhagen and Stockholm was, and we flew over onto the US from Stockholm. So that day from Amsterdam to Copenhagen, should have been a nice drive across Germany. Yeah. But in the lead up to the rally, we we basically sort of, I think we were organizing a lunch stop in Germany. And so that was the, 
the touch point for kind of whichever city that was in, maybe Hamburg, I think, to, to kind of be dealing with the authorities and yeah. to get their support. And, and actually at the time, they were very supportive. It was all absolutely cool, you know, nice organizing for several months. And then one day we got a call from one of these guys who we'd actually got to know really well and said, we've been told that the Gumball can't come. Like, you know, why? What's, what have we done? What's happened? Um, and, and bottom line was that they had had it from sort of their, let's say, chief of police or, or whatever to say, uh, actually it wasn't from the chief of police, it was from the sort of more local government to sort of say, uh, Gumball was an illegal race and it can't come <laughs> to our city. Okay. And, and so we spent, this is obviously on the lead up to, the, to one of these rallies, to that year's rally, and I, I probably then... All I did for three months, let's say, leading up to that rally was deal with getting us through Germany mm. all the time, essentially. And it went to court. We actually took the German government to court to say that we're not an illegal event yeah. and, you know, we're on TV and we're sponsored. And, of course, if people get stopped for speeding, then that's that's the individual's yeah. sort of responsibility. We're not promoting that. And anyway, we lost the court case. No. I mean as you do when you try and take on the German <laughs> government, basically. And so that court case result hearing was probably about five days before the rally was starting. Ooh. And so Ooh. I've got this whole rally to organize, you know, that needs to go through Germany to get to, yeah. to Denmark, to get to Sweden and so on. And so in, in these five days pre-rally, I had to find enough double-decker transporters and coaches to ship everyone from Amsterdam to, to the border of Denmark. And I mean, it was the craziest, biggest headache, nightmare that you can imagine. And, you know, Germany said no. Germany said no, basically, so that we couldn't come through. Um, and that was, a, that was a huge headache. And, and it cost me several hundred thousand to, to book these last minute. It was over a public holiday weekend as well, <laughs> which meant these trucks, these coaches and these transporters had to stop every so many hours. Yeah. And it turned what would have been a five-hour drive across Germany into something like an 18-hour oh. day. You know, it was one of those nightmare yeah. things. But an and entrance on the rally, they almost obviously didn't know that anything different. Maybe that was just the plan, this yeah. sort of thing, that we would do that. Obviously, that was an incredibly long day. And by the time people got to Copenhagen that evening, they were burnt out and, you know, it was, they were pretty pissed sort of waiting for their cars to arrive when they'd already got to, to uh, into Denmark in coaches. Um, but same thing. By the end of that week, crossing the finish line in Times Square, those memories have faded and people have bonded. And, and it became one of the places really that people did bond yeah. on the trip and and i think when you speak to anyone that did the 2010 rally they're like yeah that was that was the one <laughs> we did that one <laughs> it was sort of that thing and uh, anyway i to kind of finish up on this uh, borders thing i actually decided a few years later that i'm not going to give up on germany and um i, I, I can't remember which was the next one that we tackled germany i'm trying to Maybe think was, uh, You've been through Germany, yes, haven't you? So. Yes, and I remember it was like last time we got banned. <laughs> What's yeah, going to happen exactly. this time? But anyway, the, the, the next time, thankfully, but also how they gave us permission. Yeah. So you know, we we had to kind of do it. And I mean, Germany is Germany is very very strict, and there were even things like when we lost the case the first time, we actually didn't even realize all the reasons for losing the case, mm. which we were only told when we tried to go back through Germany the next time. And one of the reasons was that the cars have stickers on. Yeah. Well, if the cars have stickers on with brand names, apparently we're, we're a race. Okay. If we don't have the stickers on, we're not a race. Yeah. So the next time we came to Germany, we had to put a sort of a, a piece of tape yes. across sponsored across, stickers. Yeah just to prove that we weren't a race, basically. And, and probably had we done that back in 2010, I wouldn't have had to hire these transporters. Yeah. But of course, nobody tells you yeah, that. Yeah, so. I just tell you that. Because I remember a few people being like, oh, I don't want to deal with this. I'm just taking the stickers off. And they'd like take yeah. the stickers off and they'd drive through. Yeah. I remember yeah. we, got, we got pulled over. Um, I was with Tim at that point in time. I feel like it was the year... Was it at Copenhagen to... 
Monaco? Does that make? Did we go through no, Germany on that one? It was no. Um, I'm trying to think where we were going from. Did Stockholm you do to Nevada? 15? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Stockholm yeah, to that's the one. Las Vegas. That's that the one. one. Yeah. So yeah, I think it was with Tim and it. I was in a Bentley Continental or something and we had a police car or an unmarked car come up behind us on the motorway and was being really weird, like properly weird, (laughs) sort of undertaking and doing stuff. And I think we moved out of the way because she was just being weird and they were like, illegal lane change or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, do you know what? That's actually what caused the problem in the first place for us. So back on the very second rally, we had these two cars on the rally, um, 355 Ferrari, Australian guy, and a, a British guy in, um, what was he in? Another Ferrari. Something. Uh, something, can't remember. Anyway, they're, they're on the Autobahn, and they're driving sort of north towards Hamburg. And they are sort of, you know, driving fast on the Autobahn, basically. Yeah. Then some sort of blacked out AMG something kind of comes and, passes them by a very fast yeah. speed that wasn't on the rally. Yeah. And I think they probably thought, okay, let's catch this guy up, yeah. you know, and which they did. And and the guy wouldn't move over. So they undertook. Yeah. And this is what caused the problem. So basically these cars carried on together for sort of, I don't know, call it 10 miles or something. And during this time, these gumball cars kept on undertaking and whatever. <laughs> yeah. And this, this, you know, blacked out, you know, AMG turns out to be an unmarked oh, police car that's, that's filming all of this oh. and is racking up more fines for these guys. But I, I feel it's a little bit underhand because, you know, that was, he was the cause of that yes. sort of situation. Totally. They were driving fast in the fast lane on the autobahn on the section where you can drive fast. Yeah. <laughs> and he wasn't moving they out of the way. It didn't move out of the way. <laughs> so anyway, so they ended up getting at the time and this, this added to the sort of Gumbel's early sort of notoriety. <laughs> I think the fines were sort of circa, I think there was circa sort of 15 and 20,000 pounds per car, which is huge, as you can imagine, you know, big story. And it made the (laughs) the tabloid press over here. And, and, um, and that was our sort of welcome to Germany essentially (laughs) and how the Germans thought Gumball was forevermore. But um, we've slowly kind of, you know, got them to understand what it is. And, And thankfully over the years we've had, some very big sponsors from Germany, brands like Puma that have yeah. kind of really supported us and, you know, As it was that, helped was inform. That, was that the biggest fine that anyone's ever had? I actually think it is, yeah. I, I think it probably is. I've, I've heard of people, individuals getting bigger fines in sort of Switzerland, part of yeah, their... one mile an hour um, speed limit or something. Salary. And <laughs> actually, we've had people pulled over many times in the early years in Sweden and Finland, where, again, I think mm. it's based on your salary, but I... I do remember lots of stories where people claiming to be, you know, the mechanic or the, <laughs> it's not their car or a student yeah, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. or whatever. And I think probably at the time, 20 years ago, sort of the Europe wasn't connected online. Yeah. So they got away with it. You couldn't Google <laughs> people as easily. Yes, exactly. No, it's, yeah, there's definitely, there's a few countries where I am. Um, I mean, I drive the speed limit everywhere, but like Switzerland and places like Norway and stuff like that don't yeah. really mess with it. They don't appreciate it in the slightest. One of the things I, I know has been tricky, and I'm presuming you've had lots of issues with, is getting insurance for the rally, which fundamentally shouldn't be a problem in any way, shape or form, because you're just driving on roads in a car that you own, so your the insurance should cover it. Yeah. But yeah, that yeah, th- people seem to have come up with a specific, unless you're on gumball clause. <laughs> yeah, which is actually a, a, a frustrating one for us because actually over the years we've been incredibly safe overall. Yeah. You know, if, if the terms of cars and mileage and everything, there's been very very little to to very little insurance claims or anything to kind of put us in a in a risk category. So it is a bit frustrating, but I think it comes down to, again, that um, I, I think we probably just made too much of a spectacle for ourselves to kind of go unnoticed or, or sort of be, you know, treated like a, a, a car club kind yeah. of event, really. I mean, 
as you know, you know, it's not it's not a timed event, it's not racing, it's abiding by the rules, but we do sort of, you know, close city centers down, so there's an element of road closures. Yeah, I mean, I think uh I, I'm not quite sure. I mean, I, I always find that a strange one as well. There are some people on the rally that have multiple cars in their collection and and their insurance company will cover them for Gumball, no problem. Yeah. And there's other people on the rally that have multiple cars in their collection, and their insurance company won't cover them. So I'm not quite sure. I wish I fully understood how the insurance brokerage <laughs> world worked. But uh, I think they've just colluded. We've had to uh, we've had to have policies written specially to cover us for gumbo. Really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there is an element sometimes where we take cars to kind of countries that aren't on aren't covered on. Yeah. Let's say you know your normal policies. So there is that element. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. So you have an award called the Spirit of the Gumbo that you give yeah. out every year. What's that, and who who gets it? Well, I sort of felt like, uh, you know, as, as follows on from the last question, that we're not a race. So there is no one crosses the finish line first and wins. But we are this incredible endurance and, and adventure for a week. And you sort of, you organically have a, a finish party and you sort of want to celebrate something. So I think those first awards really just sort of took place, really, of best car, most most stylish and the sort of the coveted award as you say has become the sort of spirit of gumball which i guess i'd say i'd say goes to the car the team that sort of embraces that week the right way mm. and what what the right way is i don't know but <laughs> it's sort of almost the sort of yeah, quite often it goes to almost the underdogs it, it's gone very you know many times the the car, the team that just didn't look like they were going to make it or, I mean, the first year it went to, um, uh, Luke Craft and Dylan Murray, Gordon Murray's son, mm. um, who they both drove the, you know, they drove the rocket, Gordon Murray's <laughs> rocket oh, wow. car, which is, you know, as you know, the car it's it's a two seater. It's one in front of the other. They had to wear helmets and an intercom and, and on that year's rally, not only was that sort of a spectacle in itself and everyone was sort of, of course, when that car arrives, you almost want to clap them just yeah. because they're doing it in that car. But they also got very kind of um, confident and cocky that they realized that through Europe, uh, as you know, there's toll booths everywhere. There's road tolls everywhere, barriers. And they realized they could drive out of these barriers. <laughs> so, yeah, they were just sort of this cheeky kind of, you know, team that, that it was doing it in this crazy car. And obviously, you know, normally when we do the rally in sort of around May time, the weather's pretty bad here in Europe and at times. So they're driving through torrential rain at times. They're ducking under these barriers. They just deserved it. Yeah. It was that kind of thing. I don't know, you know, if you can exactly put your finger on it, but they deserve that award. And, and very often it's gone to sort of similar, or people that have really gone over and above and beyond in terms of what they brought to the, to the show. Mm. Sometimes people have cars built for it, you know, Team Gallag you've been part yeah. of in, in the past. I mean, to, to go and sort of commission custom cars, yeah. to bring on this is it's crazy and amazing and and so and and, and doesn't always go easy you know yeah. i mean the the tumbler that that was built oh, yeah. by, by then, the first one <laughs> i think it took three years to get one to be able to do it the yeah. others just ended up flat bedding around and, and driving the odd stage or the odd mile or something but again just adds to everything yeah totally do you have some favorite cars from over the years favorite entrance I mean, so many favorite cars and, and, um, and every year there's, there's definitely some that stand out to me, not, you know, maybe because they're again, something that's unexpected on the mm. rally. Um, but of course things that I reference again, I mean, the tumbler was, was just ridiculous to see that on the road. <laughs> yeah. It just, it, you just could not help but smile. Yeah. It, yeah. And, and imagine seeing that just driving on the road with normal cars and traffic. Yeah. And, You've got this, you know, Batman's tumbler just driving next to you. <laughs> it's just hilarious and, and and fantastic as well. But then in sort of let's say regular car world, let's say or regular supercar world, or uh, I mean, we've had everything from. I've been really impressed. We, you know, one year we had someone brought a Lola T seventy, mm. which I thought was incredible. To um, 
uh, obviously lots of the older cars that, that have done it. I mean, even that 2001 rally, Lord Montague who, of Bewley, who owned the uh, National Car Museum, mm. who sadly passed away a few years ago, of old age, I think, you know, he, he lived to a great age. And, and he did the rally when I believe he was around 80 years old. Wow. And he drove a blow Bentley. <laughs> I mean, a, a 1920s well, blow a Bentley on the rally. I mean, if you can do that, that sort of hats off, you know. Yeah. So that's got to be one of my, my favorites. But um, all the other favorites are all the uh, probably more obvious, like you know, McLaren F1 LM, yeah. um, that kind of thing, that the, the list of dream cars for me. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Where's the next rally? So this year being the crazy year that it, that it is, we yeah. had to postpone this rally. This, this maze event, which, uh, you know, first time in 20 years of having to do that, but uh, along with the rest of the world, mm. 2020 has not yeah. happened. Good old 2020. Um, so 2021, we are doing Toronto to Havana in Cuba. Okay. The last, end of May, start of June. It's also going to incorporate the Indy 500, which, which nice. we did back in 2012. Um, so it's, it's Toronto where we've been on the rally a couple of times, we've got a great fan base there and the city loves us. And, mm. you know, we do a huge spectacle for the start. And then from, uh, from, uh, Toronto to Detroit, to Indianapolis, to Nashville, to Atlanta, to Miami, to Key West, to take a car, cars over to Cuba on a boat and a lap around Cuba and finish <laughs> in, in Havana. That's the, that's the week long event. That, that sounds like it'll be pretty cool. I imagine going yeah. around Cuba will be quite an experience. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's part of the groundbreaking sort of thing. You know, the Cubans, Cubans have never seen any of these kind of yeah. cars here before. I mean, the only time anything other than sort of the, the classic old American cars have ever been there is really for the filming of Fast and Furious. Mm. So, you know, they had a couple of cars there for a couple of film shoots, of, you know, of that. But uh, can you imagine, you know, as we be seen sort of, you know, over a hundred incredible cars yeah. crossing a finish line in Havana. It, it's going to be a big, big spectacle. Yeah. It'll be very, very cool. Cool. Well, yeah. we normally wrap these up with five questions. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. Do you have a most memorable driving trip or journey? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, my most memorable drive on the rally was the rally to St. Petersburg. In 2001 it was a proper drive into the unknown and you know when we crossed the borders into eastern europe into lithuania latvia estonia and russia we had helicopter gunships flying over us <laughs> security it felt like anyone in that rally felt like they're in a movie wow. it, and it's something that i don't think could ever happen again yeah so that one's that's my most crazy gumball driving experience that, i mean that sounds pretty Badass. When yeah. I can't remember which year it was, when we went to St. Petersburg again. Yeah. That yeah. that the border to St. Petersburg, anyone that did that rally, everyone gets to yeah. get up there and was like, oh well. <laughs> yeah. Were you following police cars? Yeah, yeah we were in, <laughs> yeah. following police yeah. cars and some quite quick yeah. ones. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> It says something, right? So in some of these countries when you have police escorts and, and the gunballers can't quite keep up with the police escort. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the police yeah. escort were on it, let's just say. And yeah. then going into St. Petersburg, there was policemen at every single junction just stopping traffic whilst these other policemen yeah. are just honing yeah. into town. Yeah, and yeah, exactly. And they're like hanging out of a window following a truck that looks like an elephant and <laughs> yeah. a McLaren SLR Sterling Moss. You're like, this is bonkers. Yeah, yeah. No, that was, that was definitely a standout. Right, next question. Five car garage, unlimited value. Okay. D-Type Jaguar. Mm-hmm. Porsche 917, 917. Yep. McLaren F1 LM, uh, McLaren F1 uh, GTR, Golf Colors, yep. Race at the Mall. Is this supposed to be like Ultimate Car Garage for the family as well, or you just Ultimate it, Car Garage? It, it, it's, it's the only five cars you've got, so... One of oh, these, these are perfect for every day, so far. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Take nine seven to the shops for uh, <laughs> for a coffee, the any track time. day, whatever. Yeah, exactly. Okay, let's put in. Um, I want an LP four hundred Lamborghini mm. Countach. 
because it just looks like a spaceship yeah. still to me. So that's my everyday car. Yeah. That garage. Okay. Right? Yeah. You got one more. <laughs> <laughs> I have one more. I struggle at the moment to try and figure out what. Occasionally, I think I'm going to buy like a new supercar, a new hypercar, yeah. and I really struggle to know to, to like one of them enough. Yeah. To want to fork out that much the money. Of money. Yeah. Because I think, of course, they're all quite incredible in their own way. Mm. Um, so I'm trying to like, add something into this garage that's a bit more bit more modern. modern. But you know, I'm just going to my. I've said four already, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just just a Ferrari of forty, just because it's still the ultimate, still ultimate, uh, you know, dream toy yeah. car that that is real. Yeah. Totally. And like. The th- problem you ha- have with some of these super new stuff is one, they're yeah. all quite lardy, not all of them, but they're so fast, but so easy yeah. to drive fast. That yeah. Like you don't have a road that you can do 300 miles an hour on. No. I mean, technically no, you probably no. could in Germany, but no. Like, but occasionally I kind of, uh, you know, I have that kind of thinking, you know, Koenigsegg, Pagani, yeah. Bugatti, um, they seem to be the three that lead the way yeah. uh, in that price point. Occasionally in Ferrari, Ferrari been a bit lacking on the, on the they have. front they have. since, yeah. you know, I mean, I love LaFerrari. It's, I think it's beautiful, but what's next? I, you yeah. know, some of the things that have come along since are not quite there for me. Um, yeah, like your, your Koenigsegg Jesco or something is just yeah. a whole another category above yeah, any absolutely. of the other stuff. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that new Bugatti that just uh, yeah, yeah, was sort of unveiled yesterday. I'm, I'm kind of, uh, what's it called? Belied or Belide? something? Or? Belied? Yeah. yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it looks... Uh, I did like the Bugatti, um, the Gran Turismo car. Yeah. Yeah, that was cool. That, this is sort of that, isn't it? Like a little bit. Yeah. 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 1,800 horsepower, 1,250 kilos. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I I got some narrow streets where I live in London as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If they have a tight turning lock, it might be a bit of a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the sort of car you get plonked down on a straight road or a track yeah. and then just drive. Right, yeah. if you can only drive one car for the rest of your life and you're allowed, you are technically allowed another car, a 500 pound sort of banger on the side in case you need to want to put, cart some stuff around or whatever, kids or things. <laughs> put the kids in the 500 quid bag What's, that, that's your choice I'm just saying it's there as an option if you're like I would like a two-seater sports car I mean my one car should be out of those out of those five <laughs> dream cars of mine shouldn't it but really? because they're all very good dailies as well no yeah. problem whatsoever um well I, I always wanted to see the McLaren F1 GTR as my daily driver actually <laughs> So, I think it'd that's, be great. that's the one. Yeah. Yeah. Short tail, GTR, done. Long tail. You long, got long tail. tail. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. That, I mean, that's, that's like the apex, isn't it? Yeah. F1 GTR. Absolutely. Okay. What do you think is the most undervalued car at the moment? Of current cars or just, any, just in general? Any car that seems like it's a bit cheap from where it possibly should be. Oh, good. I mean, Porsche has always been a kind of a slightly price, better price point than uh, some mm. of their sort of sports car counterparts. But um, I, 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 you know, leading on from that question of like what car would I sort of buy, I do find it quite funny at the moment that there's a sort of this, you know, Lamborghini, Porsche, uh, Ferrari price point yeah. of supercars. And then you get this jump by. <laughs> Two million, yeah, yeah three yeah. million to the next one, sort of thing. So, you know, it made me question sometimes that uh, maybe a lot of people don't even know cars too much. You could, if you park just a just a, but you know, Lamborghini Aventador or something yeah. on the street, it looks to to the unknown Spaceship, sort of yeah. someone who's not knowledge about, about cars. That could be the most expensive, super futuristic, Definitely. you know, thing that there is. So. I don't know whether they're undervalued or just the others are overvalued. Let's say the others are overvalued. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And because uh, then you have things like the and it, it doesn't it doesn't actually appeal to me at all. But the Ferrari SF90, 
which came out yeah. what, this year, last year. And it's like, that's like a thousand horsepower and 400,000 yeah. pounds. Whereas to get a thousand yeah. horsepower previously, you needed a, a million pounds. But that's just like this faster, heavier, more four wheel drive formula that I don't, to me just doesn't, like, I'm like, what's the point? I don't get it. Yeah, no, I, I, I kind of agree with you on that one, actually. You know, sadly for me, I'm a huge sort of fan of Aston Martin as well, mm. being a very sort of, you know, the, the, it's almost the ultimate British kind of car brand. Yeah. And they've just released a few too many things for me as well that sort of almost come and gone and, and uh, you know, not got the recognition maybe or or, or just if they develop in too few units, they sort of almost seem a bit frivolous. Like yeah. why, why bother with that, the effort in it? Well, I mean, I'm a bit intrigued about the, the Valkyrie, you know, that yeah. sort of, it's, it's since it's been announced, there's been too many things that have come already. Yeah. And you see on the streets, you know, when it was unveiled at Geneva, it, that year at Geneva, that Aston really was stand out. They, were, they, yeah. they had a whole kind of, you know, display of, of, of race cars, track cars, road cars that were really amazing design. Yeah quite forward thinking but they just haven't hit the streets yet no. and it's been three they, years now and they keep sort of dropping off like we've lost the Valkyrie yeah. GTR um, I know yeah so that's been a that's been a disappointment really for me because I, I really wanted to sort of champion those and, and sort of support the British company still that's out it there, isn't it like, I think it's been tough. everyone like most people I know definitely British people and, and actually lots of non-British people love Aston Martin as a brand yeah. But they struggle to get behind the car sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And well, in answer to your question, which talking about all of that's given me a chance to, to Ponder. think away as well. I'm going to say that Lotus is still the most undervalued Fair. car out there. Fair. Because I think that new little hyper car, yeah. sports car of theirs is, is very cool. It's very cool. I was taking yeah. some pictures of it two days ago. Um, right. It's just a really cool, and they they've got a new sports car coming out next year that sits. Yeah, I was trying to like ask some annoying questions the other day, and just it, it right. sits alongside their current one, so it's it's okay. doesn't slot in between any of the current ones. It sort of goes alongside. Yeah, um, yeah. But that like if you drive a current Exige or Avora, yeah, that is. If you're into driving, that is an amazing driving experience. It's just, it's not yeah. the same as the other modern supercars. It's still light. No, it's still and, and Lotus has had a, you know, that's been their forte over the years. You know, from from the uh, original Elise and Elite and Europa and, and Esprit, they have been fantastic driver experiences yeah. in all of those cars. And of course, when they were a you know, significant Formula One team from the... 60s through to the 80s originally they were a, a powerhouse in the in the car world yeah. and a, you know a, a proper sports car brand and i do think it's very sad that in recent years it's not talk they're not talked about they're not a british car brand that the house you yeah. know the, the general public would would know about now and I, I was talking to someone about this yeah it was the lotus guys and they were saying there's not enough people like you sort of like me that most people that are buying a car don't want the ultimate driver's car. That's not what they're actually looking yeah. for. They're looking for something yeah. else, whether it's, you know, something that looks amazing or it has yeah. the Ferrari badge yeah. on it or it's just got raw numbers, which is not what Lotus makes. Um, yeah. So I don't know. They, they, the new car to me, if they pitch it right and it's somewhere around, let's say, Avora, but yeah. fast forward to 10, 15 years, but with the same ethos, and it's going yeah. to be, it's still going to have, you can have a manual gearbox yeah. and a NA powertrain or whatever. It could be. Really I, cool. The thing for Lotus is as a brand, they're just going to have to get themselves back out there again and in, 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 into kind of the wider car audience, mm. the wider world. Yeah, totally. Because people just sort of forget yeah. about them. But no, they are, they are wicked. Right. Final question. Most interesting car to you at the moment? Most interesting. It's a good question. Interesting for what reason? What are you googling? What are you looking up on Auto Trader? What are you um, oh, pondering? So you're putting it to me as opposed to kind of yeah, I guess it is to me. It's not that question as opposed to kind of generally what's the interesting no, most no, interesting no. car? <laughs> yeah, so to, to me, what am I googling? That's a that's a good thing. You know, I, I sort of have my 
Well, what I'm Googling at the moment to actually tell you what car I'm really wanting to get is not an actual car that I really can ever properly drive or enjoy, yeah. sadly, apart from the odd sort of uh, probably Goodwood or something like that. But I really want to own or would like to own an 80s McLaren Formula One car. Oh, Yes. Yes. So that's the most interesting car yeah, that I yeah. am looking at. Uh, you know, MP4 slash four, five, <laughs> six, seven, whichever one, as long as it's probably uh, had Senna sitting there yes. at some point, then that's my kind of what I'm looking at right now. Totally. And that um, I had, I don't know whether you've come across a guy called Sam Hancock. I had him on the podcast recently. He. Yeah. racist historic cars and stuff like that and i yeah. posed him with a question he was like why are people ignoring this era of f1 cars as a thing to buy like i get you can't really yeah. use them that much yeah yeah but there's a lot of them whether it's a williams car or something like that that are not very expensive when you compare them to cars like Absolutely. One or whatever with amazing history and then also they are clearly an amazing experience to drive yeah like yeah the apex yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I want one of those for every reason. <laughs> I like everything about them. Yeah. You know? So that would be my, that's also part of my five car, six car, yeah, yeah. dream car garage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah so sick livery, sick engine, everything, amazing yeah. bit of art, and you can drive yeah. it every now and then yeah. or whatever. Yeah. No, that was, yeah. wow, that's very cool. Very cool. Well, thanks very much for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure having a chat. It's been good. It's been good. Cheers. Yeah. Good. Thanks, Sam.